John here from Revolving Pens, and today I want to do the part two of the video where I show how to take photos of pens, or how I take photos of pens. This is the setup I have for a lot of my pen shots. So this is a, a light box, it has the LED lights and a reflective surface on the interior. You can see that there's a, a pen in here. This is the Pelican Machier Dragon for uh, 2023. I have my Sony with a Sigma 105 millimeter uh, macro lens, but I'm not really at a macro distance. I want to get the whole pen in focus, and I'm going to take a series of photos at a uh, wide open aperture so that I get a narrow plane of focus so I can go back into the editing software and do focus stacking. So even at this distance at a higher aperture, say f16, you know, before diffraction really sets in too bad, the whole the whole pen won't be in focus. So especially this pen is leaning back away from the camera. So there'll be parts of it in sharp focus and parts of it that aren't. And even if I angled it so that it, the pen was I guess flat or parallel against the sensor, so that more of the pen would be in focus. The pen has a round shape, and even at this distance, as as you round the edge of the pen, the, the, the focus will drop off and it won't be sharp. So with the pen leaning back and the three-dimensional shape of the pen, focus stacking really helps make, make a sharp image. And you know, would most people notice? Maybe not, but I notice, and some people will notice that, oh, this is an unusually sharp photo, and they'll recognize it consciously, consciously. And other people will just say, wow, that's actually pretty good. How'd they get all that in focus? Or even subconsciously just recognize that, hey, this is a little bit different, a little bit better than a lot of the stuff out there. So I have the, I have the pen framed in, the, in my view. This is how I want to see it. And so I'm gonna focus, I usually start at the top of the pen and I focus and then I change the focus and take an image. And I'll take about, usually about 60 images. You know, the plane of focus is fairly narrow, you know, maybe 20 microns um, at, at this distance, at this aperture, maybe a little bit more, um, but it's, it's pretty narrow. So we'll have to stack a lot of photos to uh, get a good image. And so this is just how I do it. So I have my re remote control. I already have it focused, so I'll take the first image. I'll take the first image. There it goes. <laughs> it's infrared, so it has to, it bounces out of the light box and into the sensor. Now what I do is, this has a stepper motor. This lens has a stepper motor. So I listen for a little click. So I'm gonna turn the ring and touch as lightly as possible so not to move anything. And the next image. I hear the click, wait for everything to settle down, no vibration, next image. And so on and so on and so on. So. What I'm gonna do now is transition and show you how all the photos that I got and how I edit those photos and turn them into a complete image of the pen. Okay, so for editing the images, I use Adobe Lightroom. So what I'm going to do here is uh, all the images that I imported, I'm going to look for one that I want to make adjustments to. Make corrections um, in, in color and tone and I want to find one that is sort of balanced. I mean, these are thin sections there. You can see only part of the, the uh, images in focus. And as I move from one image to the next, you can see the focal point change. So what I'm looking for is an area of focus kind of in the middle of the pen that gives me a relatively good representation of the pen overall. You know, I'm not going to be able to see all of it in focus at the focus at the same time because well that's the whole 
point of this exercise. So the first thing I'm going to do here is apply a color profile. So I'll have a color profile saved for this camera and lens combo. And we'll just select that here. And that, that does some good basic adjustments. And then often I'll go and hit the auto button on edit just to see what the program thinks the image ought to look like. That sometimes gives me a starting point. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, but I know with this camera that often I want to adjust what's called the, the dehaze and the clarity and the texture that's in the effects section. So these do some combination adjustments. I just know with this camera that those are probably going to go in there. So that's pretty normal. So I go back up to the light section and I just mo mess around. You know, I, I see how moving the sliders affects things and I get a sense of the adjustments I want to make. I have standard adjustments that I make. You know, I, I have directionality on all these adjust adjustment uh, parameters that I usually apply to pens because I'm usually using similar lighting and pens are largely similar to, similar to each other, but this pen is not reacting how I might otherwise expect. That may be for a couple reasons here. One is there's a lot of gold on it. So yes, it's a color, but it's also a metal. It's reflective. And that's kind of a problem with all this light, especially when there's basically deep blacks in there too. I mean, it's quite a, it's quite a range dealing with color and luminosity. Um, this is an adjustment that usually comes up when you, with some value other than zero in the, in the positive way, it's called vibrance. It kind of makes image, images pop a little bit more. And I'm just seeing how it looks. And I'm surprised in the auto white balance. Well, I use a 18% uh, gray card to set the white balance before I shoot, but usually it throws in some vibrance and it, it didn't this time. It, this pen is just given this camera fits. Another reason is the whole clip is in view. I usually twist the clip so it sort of faces away from the camera, but I couldn't do that in this case and then get the artwork the way I wanted to see it. And so you can see the clip is really overexposed and I could get fancy and just select the clip maybe later in Photoshop and uh, tone that down, but I'm probably going to leave it. I mean, I think most people can realize that if the clip is facing the camera and there's a ton of light on it that you might be able to see a, a very overexposed clip. Anyway, the clip isn't the inter interesting part of the pen anyway. So when I edit these images in the focus stack, I, I almost never do a mask. So I, I've applied a mask here and I'm doing a couple of things. I'm, I want to see how crisp, crisply defined the pen is from the background. And so I've, I've done just a select subject just now and messed with the sliders, the adjustments to see, you know, how it affect the image. And I think the image is fairly well set. The, the subject, the pen is fairly well separated from the background. So I'm pretty happy with that, but the, I'm not happy with the kind of distribution of the exposure. So the, the cap portion is more lightly exposed or has a higher exposure than the pen body. You know, the pen is leaning back in the, in the light box. And we have that clip there throwing back a ton of light at the sensor. I, I just think, I don't know what it is. This particular pen is causing a little bit more trouble than normal. Cause like I said, on these focus stack images, I don't usually apply masks because there's a big difference in the focal plane from the front of the pen to the back of the pen. And there can be some focus breathing with the lens, etc. And uh, you can't always be sure that the mask edits will translate from one end of the focus stack to the other end of the focus stack. So, but I really want to balance out the exposure on this. So that that's kind of what I'm doing here. I want to lower the exposure on the cap to bring it more in line and uh, look more natural with the pen body. So I'm doing some masking and at this stage, it's not my favorite thing to do. Of course, if I, this wasn't clear and it's probably not clear to many of you, I shoot in what's called raw. So the, um, images in its most 
basic form. All the information that the sensor captured is there. So that's why I'm able to make so many of these adjustments and do so without, you know, degrading the image. Well, I guess it depends what you think of my results are here. But if you take pictures and you take them as a JPEG or a TIFF or something, that has all the settings sort of baked in and you're not really able to do a good job with the, the edits. It's just not really possible to make all the fine adjustments, especially in color and color balance. So another thing that I know with this camera is that it tends to overexpose these gold parts of Machia pens. So again, yes, it's a color, but it's also metal. So it, it sort of throws back light towards the sensor independently. And often I need to lower the luminance on yellow, a gold, and red. It tends to overexpose red as well, this camera. So, you, you, you know, you just have to learn your camera. You know, that's another thing about this. You need to get some experience with your camera. And, you know, computational photography with like an iPhone, you know, it's pretty good. But when you want to get a certain result and get the best result you can possibly get, you need to still use a real camera. And, you know, the, it cannot match the detail or flexibility and image editing that you get with a, a real camera shooting raw. So this pen continues to throw me for a loop a little bit. I'm not doing my normal adjustments here. So I'm really kind of, at this point, sort of hoping it comes out good. But I'm more or less happy with the, the image now. I'll, you know, kind of make some adjustments um, more, I think. I don't know. Let's just copy all the adjustments, including the masking and apply it to all the images. And then we'll take a look at the images and see if I'm happy enough to export them and stack them. I've already done this once with this pen. So here I'm just applying all the masking edits to all the images at once. So we've got 18 images in one direction of the image, image, image I was adjusting. And uh, I have a Mac Studio. I got the Mac Studio basically because I got a medium format Fuji and the 100 megapixel sensor puts out some pretty ginormous files. And also focus stacking is pretty computationally intensive. So this, this machine makes pretty short work of medium format digital images and focus stacking. So that's nice. All right, so I've applied all the, the edits. That little, those little blue circles are just it's updating to the cloud. It doesn't, it doesn't really take longer to, longer to apply the edits. So basically I'm gonna look at the beginning and the end and make sure I'm happy with you know, the exposure, the tone, the contrast, etc. cetera, in each, each image. And yeah, you know, it looks, looks okay. I'm gonna export all these. So for the focus stacking, I wanna export as a TIFF. So I want to have a, as high a res resolution sort of baked in image as possible. So I'm gonna export a 16-bit TIFF. Because they're not 16-bit files, at least not from the Sony, maybe they're 12, Optimistically 14, I, I think 12 bit probably. This, the Fuji film will do 16 bit color depth. But anyway, I don't wanna throw away any bits, so we'll overcompensate there. So I'm exporting all the files and I just export them to a folder. Like I said, I, I tried this once already. Uh, you can see it on the bottom left, the result, resultant file and I wasn't super super stoked with it so I'm doing it again here so I exported everything gonna open Photoshop and this is the image I had before and that image look at the cat band it's kind of oversaturated that gold there and then the clip again is super light 
which I can live with, but just the balance there, I didn't like that much. So all the files I just exported, you, you do what's called load them into a stack. So basically just selecting them all at once. And each individual image you can see in the lower right will go in a layer. So Photoshop works in layers. It's exactly what it sounds like. Each image is like a piece of paper in a stack. And they're independently uh, editable, but in this case, we're gonna focus stack. So I have a script I built in. So I'm gonna uh, run the script and the first thing it'll do is select all the layers and then it'll align the layers based on content. So when you take the, the photos, you know, this lens, these lenses that I use, they're, they're not, I think the right term is par focal. The, the focus, the size of the image that's thrown onto the sensor will be a little bit different at one end of the focal range versus another. So, you know, very, very expensive cinema and TV lenses they have a lot less of what's called focus breathing. So a different image size at the extremes of the, um, the focus. So that's really minimized in really, really expensive lenses, you know, like these $100,000 TV lenses, but that's not what we're working with here. So on one, as I, as I take the images for the focus stack, there'll be some focus breathing. And for a larger object like this, the best thing to do for focus stacking is to adjust the focus versus moving the camera forward and back. That's another technique that works a little bit better with smaller objects um, versus changing the focus. For a larger object like this that is also leaning backwards away from the sensor, it's just changing the focus is the better way to do it. And you want to get about 10% overlap in focus from one image to the next. And it, you can calculate all this if you know how, away your, how far away your sensor is from the subject and you know your aperture, you can easily calculate the, the depth of the focal plane. So. Or you can just do it by experience, right? If you take a series of images and then you get a poor result in the uh, focus stack, then, you know, maybe go back and try some thinner sections. One thing, if it, if it uh, doesn't do a good job, the computer program will just insert information it'll often be blurry in spots and if you get like these blurry spots in your focus stack you probably need more information and get more images sometimes focus stacks can go into the hundreds of images and so after all the alignment and the adjustment for any differences in you know focus breathing the size of the image then what the program is doing now is just blending all of them together so it's finding areas that are in focus and out of focus and only blending the layers if they're in focus. So that's the whole point of the focus stacking. There's another kind of focus stacking that astrophotographers do. You know, they'll take you know, relatively short exposures of the same field and get, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands, and uh, get a brighter image. Anyway, that's not what we're doing here. We're trying to get it in focus all the way. So here's the final result. You know, offhand, I think it looks pretty good. You know, in the there's some darkness in the edges, and that's from the light box. I'm not concerned about that because we're gonna crop this image, right? We're not gonna not gonna leave it like that. We want to crop in a little closer. And again, this is a 40 some megapixel camera, so cropping the image doesn't throw away too much here. And I just want to get an aesthetically pleasing crop. The first time that I did this, I also realized later that I wasn't super happy with my my crop. I didn't really like how it looked. And I think at this point, you know, I'm actually kind of getting kind of tired of manipulating this image. So taking me a second here to get the the crop that I want. And I don't know about either. So let's let's start over and try again. You know, I try to uh, 
fill as much of the image space as possible with a subject. Um, and then it depends. Try to leave a little bit of context. You know, my images are a little bit more clinical, a little bit more museum catalog or whatever. Usually not including any environmental images, but sometimes pens floating in space look weird too. So it can be nice to see the, the stand here that it's on. They can look a little rendery if, if you don't have any context at all. Or I mean, it just depends, I guess. So I want to zoom in here real close and get rid of any dust or debris. One nice thing about Machia pens, is that this is some dust on the base and the stand. I'm just going to get rid of that. I, I think if you're going to do a good job with the images, you really need to go and do this step of removing dust. You know, a lot of people take pictures of pens. Not so much pens because usually they're very far away. They're not doing macro. But people who do macro pens and I see dust, I'm like, oh, come on, man. And then... Um, in another space I follow, watches. Oh my gosh, people just need to clean their watches before they take macro shots. It's and remove dust and debris. It's just really need to do that. One thing that the eraser tool has a limitation of on these metal parts, it it tends to leave blurry spots. So I'm very careful with how it looks after removing the spot. You can't just remove the spot. You have to make sure it looks good once the spot is removed. Uh, with Machia pens, there's a lot of place where the artwork just can hide dust. And that, that's actually very helpful versus a, just a plain glossy pen. Um, removing some of the dust here. And you, you might think, well, those are really small spots. What, why bother? Well, I can see them. And it's not, you know, I do have a color calibrated high resolution monitor here. So what I'm essentially doing is what's called pixel peeping. I'm getting very close and seeing what's there. But, you know, when you... See the image overall, even if you're not pixel peeping, the cumulative effect of dust and debris and, and spots that really shouldn't be there, that, that has an overall negative effect on how you perceive the image. And Well, I'm trying to present good images. And sometimes the spot, you see like here, the spot removal is not really doing a good job. It's leaving something that looks worse than the, than the spot. Sometimes changing the size of the of the spot removal circle helps and some other parameters, but sometimes it doesn't and I just leave well enough alone. What I don't do is hide any imperfections or flaws. I'm basically just looking to remove dust and debris. And of course I clean pens before I Take the, these photos I mean, to get in high resolution images and you can see fingerprints and dust and who's he what's it's and if the metal trim has corroded in some way and a lot of older pens it, it has so you know it's like you strike it strike a balance between showing that and not showing that you know you can adjust the light to kind of make things look better but you can see front to back Right there, all the way to the edge, that's in focus. This would not look this crisp if I just taken a single image at, say, f16. Or, a, a, you know, a higher f-stop, you know. First off, at six, f16, diffraction starts to blur the image overall. It's not that bad. I mean, I've shot up to f22 with, you know, decent results. But with the focus stacking, you know, people may not notice explicitly unless they are sort of photo nerds but uh, people do notice implicitly or subconsciously that you know the image is you know maybe uniquely good because there's no out of focus regions so that focus stack went well pretty well actually so i'm going to import it back into into lightroom and make any final adjustments that i want to now, it's a TIFF now. It's not a RAW file anymore. So I'm kind of limited to the adjustments that I can do without negatively affecting the image quality. But let's just see what we got here. You know. Looks pretty good. This is the first one. This is the, the second one. So. I feel like. Definitely like this one a little better. So, well, I don't know. Subtly different. 
you know, see if you can you see if you can spot the differences. I can see it, so we're gonna go with this one. And uh, first thing I want to do is adjust the background. So this masking, where you do these very gross things, very large kind of adjustments, you can kind of get away with. So I want to leave a little bit of the background in here, again to give some sort of context that you know it's not just a pen floating in space. But I want to have the, I don't know, the focus be only on the pen and not the, not the stand or, you know, the background, which you can't really see the background here per se, it's just a big white sheet. Sometimes it looks better with it being a little bit gray. I don't think it looks better in this case. The masking isn't perfect, so if you saw some of the adjustments that I did to the background, it also affected the pen, especially on the edges. But it's, you know, it's pretty good. So, you know, it's starting to look not too bad. So we're getting this final adjustments on this image through the, through the masking, you know, turning it off and on, we can sort of be a little bit more confident in our a result but I want to tweak it just a little bit more you know uh, this image is going to go out in the world with my watermark on it and I, I want I want every image that I send out to be the best image that I can get at that time if I had my druthers in this pen I would have angled the clip away but then we wouldn't see as much of the artwork as we can see now so yeah uh, that, that area is a little bit less offensive, a good tonal balance and color top to bottom. And this is the, yeah, let's just kind of zoom in here. Focus front to back, colors looking pretty good. A lot of good detail there. You know, that, that rod and pearl is in focus where it wouldn't be otherwise. Um, this pen has some unique features that we're going to dive into in the photo series on Instagram, but that red stuff is opal which is pretty cool, or is probably opal. So there we have it, the final image, focus stacked. I um, I mentioned I, I have a color calibrated high resolution monitor. It's also pretty bright, so I have to compensate usually. So I know people will be looking at these on their iPhone, iPad, whatever, something that isn't a super bright color calibrated monitor. So I usually brighten it up so where it doesn't look as awesome here and um, export it like that. There we are, focus stacking.